What if like an LCK fan watches this and says, hey, maybe what if pushing players to the extreme is what it takes to make it to the world championship? And maybe this is why LCK and LPL is always ahead of the LEC. There's not many. What was a turbulent summer season for them? From quarantine to burnout with MSI, they continued to fight and fight and fight. And just as Mac promised, it came to playoffs and they were a cut above. And they were just too good for everyone else. I think it was like somewhere in the middle of the 2021 summer split that Red Lion players talking about the MSI Blues, talking about the fact that the MSI may have been a bit of a toll on the players. And as a viewer of the LEC, I was very impressed on both Mad Lions and LEC on rather than avoiding the subject, but actually highlighting it. And did you ever get tired of that question at one point? <laughs> No, it's it's not something that, that I personally got tired of. I think it's a really important topic to discuss. And I think it's really important that players, staff, casters, managers, like whoever, anyone, should be able to talk about it openly. I think it's really important that you can talk about it openly. And I think that there was... Uh, I went on a bit of a rant on one of the LEC uh, broadcasts. Uh, what I was railing against there was people kind of... I don't know, insinuating that it was a weakness of yeah. some sort to talk about these things publicly. Mm. It's not a weakness. It's a strength. Like, it shows strength to be open about your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses and your emotional experience. I think the, the Mad Lions players and staff and I personally have had a lot of people who you would, like, a lot of people that you wouldn't think about, people who are veterans of the scene, people who have been in the scene for a lot longer than I have, mm. message me to say... I'm really glad that you said that. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> you know, um, and I think that just goes to show how little people feel comfortable and how little people feel that it's acceptable to talk about these things because, you know, you're scared that there's going to be a backlash from people of, um, oh, you're not working hard enough or like all the G2 vacation memes back in the day, you know, I think there's a lot of fear of, of backlash from fans and pundits and commentators and other players and orgs, right? It can be tough and people people are afraid of that for sure people are afraid of those of those negative sentiments coming coming back to bite them so people obviously don't feel comfortable to discuss these things openly um so i'm glad that we did and i'm proud of our players being comfortable enough to say hey this was really hard or hey yeah. we struggled emotionally with this because many players have gone to say that yeah, I wanted to take some time off league and Bad Lions actually allowed that. Bad Lions actually gave us a lot of support around recovering from this MSI Blues that we are feeling. Uh, when did you first notice and, and as a head coach decide, okay, we will fully support the players through this process? Uh, I mean, I think every split in my career has been a process of understanding myself mm. and how how I respond to stress over a long period and how I can cope with that better and how I can burn out less. So spring actually was, was one of the best ones. I, did, I wasn't burnt out at all at the end of spring, whereas you know in previous years, I've been like completely dead by the end of the regular season a lot of the time. Um, and playoffs was just kind of like limping over the finish line, right? But I think it only really hit during MSI where, uh, because the schedule was so intense. Because we, I mean, we were, we were in Iceland for I think one month where it was a 31 day month. And in those 31 days, our players had one off day where they weren't scrimming or playing mm. or doing content one off day in 31 days um and at that point you know obviously people are tired and you you know like because you you work with these people every day you can see that they're tired you can see that they're emotional you know that they have stuff going on in their personal lives that's not being attended to and that's building up and building up and building up because mm. they're busy and they have been busy for mm. four months at this point right um, and as a family member or a girlfriend or whatever it is of someone involved in a profession like that, um, there are certain things that you can't deal with while that person is in a different country and also playing the most important match of their life tomorrow or whatever it is, right? Like you can't, so a lot of issues have to be swept under the rug and that's a sacrifice that players and the families and partners of players agree to make, right? Being conscious of, of all of that, I think halfway through MSI, we decided hey, uh, at the beginning of summer split, let's let's just take it easy for two weeks. Let's go to restaurants. Let's go 
out on a boat trip let's have a barbecue let's play football outside like let's soak up some sunshine all of this stuff was stuff that we decided or even you know let's bring people's girlfriends over and give them some time to spend with their girlfriends let's let's bring their families over during summer we allocated a budget for allowing their families and oh, girlfriends wow. of players to be able to travel over to berlin yeah so you know we'd say you know like <laughs> we've taken yeah. your son away from you for an additional six weeks on top of the three months that he's been with us for um come and visit mm. uh, i'm really proud of, of mad lions for doing that uh, i think that was a, a wonderful wonderful initiative so shout out to um our management to till and to alex and to um adam and chris who are the um who are my bosses basically so yeah that that was the plan <laughs> that was the plan okay okay yeah. which didn't end up happening oh no because... i was like really happy listening to this but okay didn't necessarily it, it was nice story, still... okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you led me on <laughs> you gotta say that was the plan okay. which hmm? uh when we got back to berlin uh shortly after arriving so i was in the uk which was a red zone so i had to do a mandatory two-week quarantine with no exception on upon arriving in berlin um, and at the end of my quarantine period, after I'd been in quarantine for two weeks, on like the 12th day or something, uh, someone inside the LEC team tested positive for coronavirus. Yeah. So everyone had to go into quarantine. <sighs> so then that was another two weeks. Yeah. Um, uh, and then towards the end, towards like the seventh or eighth day of that quarantine, someone else tested positive. So there's another two weeks. Um, so I didn't see my players in person between between Dan one MSI uh, and week four of mm. the regular season. I, di I didn't see anyone. <laughs> like, we're all just in our bedrooms. Random question. I know that esports has a lot of prejudices. It's only been around 10 years, but during the 10 years, we seem to have built up so much prejudices. And one of them is that players have to grind nonstop during the regular season and if they kind of even show signs of slack or having a girlfriend or having a free time or going to the parties then you will see a noticeable performance drop what do you think about this prejudice and what do you think would have happened with Mad Lions if the management didn't give the free time that they the players needed I think that that's a very short term mentality and mindset mm. uh, I think you can so League of Legends is is a, a closed circuit, right? It's a uh, as as a game, as something that you learn. It's like learning chess, right? Like mm -hmm. chess is a game where the rules stay the same, and you can get better and better and better just by pouring time into the game. And League of Legends is the same. You can improve at the game in that way on an individual mechanical like pattern recognition level because it's a game that's very heavy in pattern recognition. So pouring time into League of Legends will help you to a certain degree. Um, However, there are more aspects of League of Legends than there are to chess. Chess is a 1v1 game. Mm -hmm. You don't have a team in chess. You don't have draft in chess. In chess, your pieces are worth the same every game. In League of Legends, they're not because there are new champions. Some champions have global. Some champions have long engage range. Some champions have poke, right? Like mm -hmm. the game functions very, very differently on a game to game basis. So, and, and the meta changes very often, right? Like chess doesn't have patches every two weeks. Um, so why am I talking about chess? Because the reason that I think that approach to just pure volume training does not work in league of legends even though it works in chess for sure it mm. does um is because league of legends is so much more about adaptability and flexibility and it's a team game so mm. qualities in your person are really really important in league of legends right like the ability to take responsibility the ability to be a leader the ability to communicate all of these things are really important to be a good team in anything league of legends included um and, e and in communication in esports is argu arguably even more important than in a lot of traditional sports because you have one screen that you're looking at, right? Like, I don't know what my teammate is seeing. It's not like on a mm -hmm. football pitch where we both see everything or like everything, right? Um, or at least more. Um, those qualities that are super important, aside from just pure, raw League of Legends pattern recognition skill, are qualities that will degrade significantly in a person who has not slept properly who is not getting a good diet, who hasn't had enough vitamin D, who hasn't exercised properly, who doesn't have an emotional support network, who doesn't have a philosophy that they believe in to strive towards, because that's just how human beings work. There's a quote that we like to say about sleep to our players, which is that there is not a single function in your entire body, which is not improved by getting good sleep or damaged by getting bad sleep. It doesn't exist. People who have had one less hour of sleep in a night are 
more likely to lie. They're more likely to cheat. They're more likely to steal. Oh wow! Like it, it okay. affects you yeah. so much, oh. and that's just sleep, right? Um, so yes, you can get better at League of Legends individually by investing huge sums of time in the short term, but it's not sustainable, and I don't even think it's good from a perspective of being a good team. Um, because being a team is so much more complicated than just being good at League of Legends. Um, so in answer to your question, what would have happened if Mad Lions had pushed our players in that way? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we probably would have collapsed as a team, to be honest with you. Because my, my view of Burnout is And we see that, to be honest, no... even though no, people don't vocalize it, we sometimes see that in leagues. Oh, oh yeah, so. certainly. There's a, there's a parallel in traditional sports, right? There's what's called overtraining syndrome. Um, an overtraining syndrome can literally end an athlete's career. Like, if you look up the physiology of it, it's not even well understood scientifically. It's something where you can get injured super easily and feel fatigued. And if you push over that limit, sometimes your body will just say no, and it will just stop you. And it will put anything in your way to stop you. It will put anxiety. It will put depression in your way. It will put repeated injuries. It will put fatigue in your way. Like... It doesn't matter like there is a there is a point where your body will tell you no that's enough we're not doing that anymore if you arrive at that point usually there's no going back um like feel free to if you're listening feel free to google it like the history of athletes who've had their careers ended by overtraining syndrome mm -hmm. it's prolific um i remember seeing someone um someone post a list of really successful eastern esports athletes who had endured the like 12 hours or like 16 hours a day training regime you know and you know this was a success story you're quoting someone who has chronic wrist pain and type 2 diabetes in his early 20s as a success story really like and this is what i mean about like point of no return yeah once you reach that point of chronic pain and i know i am a chronic pain sufferer you can't go back there is something in your body that changes. Your nerves literally change the way that they are wired. They, they are built differently. Like you can observe structural changes hmm. in someone who is suffering chronic pain in the way that their nerves are shaped. Like that takes a lot, like a lifetime of rehabilitation to fix. Type two diabetes, that doesn't go away. That's with that person for life now. And that's a result of the paradigm that that person has lived through. And yes, Uzi was an amazing, amazing, amazing player. But he could have been so much more. And if you look at the history of really successful sporting athletes, if you look at the career of Michael Jordan, let's mm, say, mm. Uh, that guy retired in what was his best ever season. And like, if you, there's like a super famous documentary about Michael Jordan, right? Um, the Last Dance, mm -hmm. uh, which is on Netflix. And, you know, when he talks about that, like in his mind, he was a, you know, that was like his, his seventh championship or something. Uh, and that was the peak of his career and that's his biggest regret is not being able to go back and carry on playing you know because as you grow you stop being this player and this happened in michael jordan's case you stop being this player who is dominating the game on his own who is relying on individual outplay who is just aggression and passion and brute force and you become a you become a master of the game right you become a master of motivating your teammates and you grow to become a lot more than just an athlete you become a leader and an inspiration and someone that can you know create like a franchise like a dynasty forming franchise right in the case of michael, michael jordan um and that's something that uzi could have had yeah for sure uh and he was robbed of that and i think that's really sad i think i was quite vocal about on twitter a few times i really don't like the inherent disregard for veterans that we see in the current League of Legends scene that when a, an old player doesn't perform as well it's like okay he it's time for him to retire he's washed up but when an older player does well it's like oh he's good for an older player do you think if because you described a few things about helping promote longevity of a player that we might actually see League of Legends players enjoying longer careers something that has hasn't been tested before yeah, I mean, so I think the current model that we have in League of Legends, yeah. the selection pressure, right, the things which force athletes out of League of Legends, those pressures do not select for 
good League of Legends players necessarily, or mm. not only good League of Legends players. They they select for people who are able to tolerate the environment that comes with having a professional League of Legends career. For example, if you compare League of Legends to Counter Strike, Counter Strike, which is arguably a much more mechanically intense game than League of Legends, actually, and League of Legends is much more about decision making, which isn't impacted by age at all, um, and your reaction speed doesn't like actually start to decrease until your mid 30s yeah um csgo players go into their into their 30s like the players who are winning major after major after major after major in csgo have until recently been in their 30s um why do we not see league of legends players who are able to do that well the difference is because the lifestyle that comes with being a league of legends pro is very different uh, if you look at uh astralis the, the super famous csgo team those guys took huge breaks between international tournaments where they could go home. Yeah. They would turn up before an international tournament, practice for two weeks, super intensely, play the tournament, and then go home and not play Counter-Strike for a while, right? Mm. They certainly don't compete in a regular season league which lasts for 10 weeks, followed by playoffs for three weeks, followed by international tournaments for another six weeks. There's no period of the year where those guys compete for 20 weeks running, as far as I'm aware. It doesn't happen. Um, and that's the thing that drives people out of League of Legends. It's the intensity of the schedule. It's not the fact that they are no longer capable. It's the fact that we have matches on Fridays and Saturdays, for example. So the only day that we can do anything on is Sunday. And if you're in Germany on a Sunday, well, good luck doing anything because everything's closed on Sunday. And in uh, LCK and LPL, where they play BO3s, the schedule is even worse, right? Like it's it's even harder because you'll have two random days throughout the week, right? You might play Tuesday, Wednesday, a BO3, scrim, 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 scrim. And then, I don't know, next Monday, Tuesday, a BO3, right? Uh, that's an insanely intense schedule. So what I mean about the selection pressure then is, of course, people who cannot deal with that are going to be driven out of the game. Because when you start hitting the age of, what, 24, 25, well, maybe that's just when people want to start settling down and actually living a life rather than living a half-life with one day of free time a week away from your loved ones in a country that isn't your home country. Just a fun fact, I was maybe. looking at a calendar of an LCK team. I'm not going to say which team, but I was looking at their calendar and they had one free day of an entire month. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the standard for LCK and LPL. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in, in LEC, we have four, which is a lot better than one, that's for sure. But it's still not a life. The result of that is that you end up with people who, after five years of playing, six years of playing, even seven years of playing since they were 16, 17, get to a point where they start to wonder about what else there is in life, right? Because they haven't been able to experience any of that. What's it like having a girlfriend? What's it like having a pet? What's it like having your own house? What's it like living in your own country? What's it like going to university? What's it like having a, a normal job and a nine to five where you get to come home and do whatever you want? What's mm -hmm. it like having hobbies? Uh, and suddenly they're age 25, with enough disposable income to be able to do all of these things because they've been making a, an esports athlete salary for seven years, but they have no time. So why would you continue? Uh, and I think that's what pushes people out of esports. I don't think mm. it's drive or their age or their reaction speed or anything like this. Like so when I did several interviews around this subject, both in the LEC and LCK, um, discussions popped up and there were there was like a one discussion about why is the schedule in League of Legends so intense? And one of them, like, I'm just going to throw out ideas to you. One of them was, hey, like, the schedule that Riot has set when League of Legends was not an established sport is simply not feasible. Um, another argument was that that League of Legends continues with the meta changes once every two weeks, which is exciting for the audience, but maybe it's not sustainable for players to continue chasing up with them. What do you think about those arguments? Like, why I think is the... League of Legends schedule so intense compared to other esports? I'm not sure why it's so intense. One thing that I uh, strongly believe is that the um, schedule for the year should be changed. There is an off season during the summer months. Like, every year I watch my summer escape me without me having been outside at all yeah. <laughs> for the entire entirety of summer, yeah. uh, which is really sad. Uh, it's also strange that you would have your summer season there because the summer season is in theory the one that has the most viewership and summer is the time when you get the least viewership because people are outside in summer. Um, so that's something that I think would help um, in general. Mm -hmm. When it comes to patch changes, I uh, actually, there was a Euphoria episode recently where they had a member of the balance team on and I oh, asked yeah. them uh, why the why the patches are so big nowadays. Um, 
why nowadays there are kind of 23 champion changes in one patch very frequently right. every two weeks two item changes tower changes jungle changes like big systemic changes uh, and the response i got was that there have not been big changes which is not true um was that they didn't think that they were changing things and rapidly. also on specifically uh, which, on twitter on that patch change leading up to wells we wanted a big change that's what the literally <laughs> Yeah, That's what the patch notes said. Change, right? We played playoffs on 11.15. We yeah. will play Worlds on 11.19. Yeah. That's four patches. Yeah. And each of those patches has like 20 changes in it. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. The, the the burden of adaptation is, is huge, right? Um, and that's also something that shortens players' careers because players are brought up in one um, paradigm of how you play the game. And then it changes mm. and then suddenly they're not a good player anymore yeah. because riot decided to change the way that jungle works yeah. again which they change every single year and I think every single year the i think it's much more every single that. year <laughs> this year they did it like after msi or like during like, msi like, like during we're, MSI, we're, we're trying to practice yeah. in solo queue at msi and the, the way that the jungle works is fundamentally changed <sighs> like it doesn't it doesn't make sense right yeah um so like that, for example, like as an example, I think that people in general and people at Riot perhaps don't realize the gravity of those changes to the way that the professional meta works. And like the jungle has been a very difficult role for Riot to balance because they always end up with either ganking junglers or carry junglers. There's never an in-between. Um, but the problem with that is that we tend to flip-flop from one paradigm to another where we're doing either dog junglers or carry junglers. And what that means is that for a team, the entire way that you communicate your early game planning and your team fighting and your setups and your lane prios and your draft changes because suddenly like in one paradigm in a ganking jungle paradigm your lanes are the ones that is telling your jungle where to be mm. and in a carry jungler meta it's the opposite your jungler must be the leader of the team and if you have a jungler that cannot lead a team he cannot play carry junglers that's just the way it is uh and that's really really hard like you can't plan for that when you sign a player to a three-year contract for whether or like you know you have to find someone that can do both and that can lead right but that's like those players are very rare um so of course you will get players who go in and out and in and out and in and out and up and down and i think if you look at the history of um junglers in lec i would i, I don't know if, know if this is a fact whatsoever but i would be willing to bet good money that jungle is the position that changes the most in lec by far mm. but i think it's the position where the most rookies come in and do well and the most changes are made by far, Razzle, because Elio, of the yeah. fact that we change jungle Inspired. paradigm every year. Yeah, yeah. Whippo treats. Oh yeah. Like I think jungle is by far the, the position which people come into and is changed the most because people like sign a jungler in one jungle meta and then you have to get rid of them one year later because the jungle meta changes and that player no longer has the skill set that's required to actually play the game at, at, at like a high competitive level. Like this is a very hypothetical argument that I may be doing for the devil's advocate's sake, but coming into the MSI there was like so much jungle changes while Lee Sin was no longer necessarily like a jungle pick it's like top line everywhere so you kind of have to pra practice it as a flex pick and also Rumble's like really high tier like Morgan is like super super high tier and like you kind of have to practice Diana too so players who could have like practiced on team building and building up team atmosphere and maybe take a break after going through the whole entire playoff before playing for MSI now had to play a lot of solo queue in order to adjust and build up proficiency in the new champions that were never really jungle champions before i sometimes yeah, think yeah, about that definitely. yeah yeah definitely you like we qualified to um to msi playing udir and volibear right and yeah. we were really good with udir and volibear now udir <laughs> was still in the meta at msi to be fair yeah but like imagine if you are a player who like is really 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 good on volibear and that's your specialty and that's the thing that qualified you to msi mm. and then the meta changes and like suddenly you're not a good team anymore right mm. like that's pretty rough i'm being a devil's advocate here from the team perspective from the purely financial perspective maybe taking in young players and going through that intense work regime might be more cost beneficial so why should the teams and the organizations and the league care about the longevity of players good question good question i mean at least my belief is that you will have the best team possible and you will have a team that actually lasts when people are happy and they're fulfilled and they feel like they can trust people around them. Fun fact, 
uh, the biggest predicting factor of whether or not an athlete gets injured is not how much they stretch, it's not their diet, it's not their sleep, it's their emotional support network. Mm. If an athlete has poor family relationships, no friends on which to rely, bad personal relationship with their partner, lots of stress in their life, because of those things, lots of emotional stress, they are much more likely to get injured. So as an organization, not only do you have a responsibility to look after these kids, right? Because a lot of these kids are leaving home age 17, right? And like, I personally feel a lot of responsibility of their parents are trusting me to care for them. You know, if they were in school, if they were in university, they would have a counselor, they would have pastoral care, they would have people who like specialists and experts whose job it is to look after these young people's mental health, right? And their parents are effectively trusting me to look after them, right? So number one, there's a moral responsibility there. But number two, like it benefits you as an organization to look after your players. It means you will have a better team. They will be happier. They will last longer. They will get injured less. They will be more loyal to you. They will speak better of you. You'll have a better reputation, right? Like everyone wins. Um, it's just harder to do. What if like an LCK fan watches this and says, hey, maybe again, being a devil's advocate because I really, I'm really care about this subject too. What if pushing players to the extreme is what it takes to make it to the world championship and maybe this is why lck and lpl is always ahead of the lec there's not many there's not really a good counter argument to that right but the the question is what success in life looks like to you europe has obviously made some world finals in the last few years hmm. does success to you look like someone who gets to the world finals and is smiling and laughing and enjoying league of legends and continues to enjoy league of legends for many years as i'm sure a player like caps for example will who was in that world final or does success look like the guy who had to retire next year with chronic wrist pain and type 2 diabetes because if that's what success looks like then i don't think that's what i want not for my players thank you so much and i hope this conversation did give some food for thought to people who are watching this out there i appreciate it and best of luck for 2021 wells thank you very much